252. Okay, we can get started. Enrichment, Enlightenment, Transformation. Rabbi Yisroel Cutler, the spiritual leader of Chabad of Cary, North Carolina, guides anyone who has been searching for a meaningful life and conscious living. Join our discussions about the mundane, our daily activities, and then infuse every day with a spiritual twist from the inspired sages of the Talmud and Jewish mysticism, which many call Kabbalah. We learn from the root source of all religious monotheistic traditions and delve into the symbolism and levels of meaning from biblical stories. A very good morning to everyone out there, uh, those here at Chabad of Kerry, um, as well as those tuning in from all over the world. Thank you for joining us. Let us know that you are joining us. Uh, you can ask questions on the chat box or even just give us a shout out. And let us know uh, where you're listening from. It would be good to hear from you. And if you do enjoy listening, we deeply appreciate you supporting the program by hitting the donate button on nissancommunications.com, which will assist us in having um, to ensure that we can have this program streamed live every single week. So before we dive into the actual story in the Parsha, just by way of introduction, you know, there, there are two ways of doing something. You can do something out of necessity, you got to do it, and you can do it with joy. You can do something as something that is just part of your day, and you can do something because this is where you want to be. And obviously there are many differences between the two ways you do it. One of them is how easy is it to have something distress you? When you don't really want to be somewhere, it's almost as if any opportunity that comes up will take you away from it. Yeah, I got to do it, but I'm hoping for that opportunity that'll take me away from it. When I'm fully present and when I'm doing something with, uh, with, 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 with joy, then it's going to take a lot and I'll be able to overcome all sorts of adversities in order to make sure I get the job done. We're going to get back to that theme a little bit later. The Parsha discusses a fascinating story. That is the story of Bilam, the non-Jewish prophet who was hired to curse the Jewish people. This is the one time in Torah where if you have, hey, can I get to see him? If you have a camera lens on the Jewish people, the entire story, from when Moses is born until the end of the Torah, where is the only time where the camera shifts? And we're not seeing the story from the Jewish perspective, but it's as if the camera scene is now focused on somebody else. The Jews are the third party. They're the bystander. That's this week's Torah portion. Because the entire Parsha discusses a fellow by the name of Bilam, who's hired to curse the Jewish people by a tribe of Moab. And we hear the story all from Bilam's perspective. Were the Jews throughout all of this? Just watching. So it's interesting from a stylistic perspective how this is a totally different uh, uh, style than the rest of the Torah. There's a lot of meaning in these stories. You can tell a lot about you from your enemies, right? You can learn a lot from you the way people that don't like you speak about. So we have from Bilam's prophecy all sorts of lessons and messages. Um, we're not going to dive into the actual storyline so much today, so I'll just give you a, the two-minute version. The two-minute version was the nation of Moab was petrified that the Jewish people were on their way to Israel. The truth is that they had nothing to be afraid of. And the reason for that is God told the Jews, don't pester Moab. They're not supposed to be one of the nations that you're supposed to conquer. Anyone know that? Moab was hands off. They were related somewhat to the Jewish people. They have some sort of, of, of connection. And God said, you are not allowed to strike them. It's interesting. Even when we talk about the conquest of Eretz Yisrael, it wasn't just like, all right, take whatever you want. There was a specific strip of land that the Jewish people were allowed to get. There were other areas that were off limits. Moab was one of those areas that were off limits. The Jews were not allowed to strike Moab. 
That being said, Mo was still afraid. Well, yeah. they had good reason to be afraid. Yeah. Why? Because they they didn't know that they were on the good list. Oh, that's and, true. And, <laughs> and they were able to see that God is with these people. They okay. Cause a lot of. That's interesting. Did they know that they were on the good list? All right, that's a good point. I never thought about before. How did they know that they were on the good list? Was that information available for the masses or not? I, I, I think they were right to be afraid. Right. I don't know if the press covered that. You're saying. Yeah. But they saw that two other tribes in last week's Torah portion that fought the Jewish people were defeated, and they were the mightiest. Sichon and Og, the Amorites uh, from the tribe of Bashan. So they con- they tried defeating the Jews. They were conquered. And Moab said, if they were conquered, and they're even stronger than us, let's not go that route. Let's fight fire with fire. If the Jews' main power is their spirituality, let's fire Bilam. And Bilam is an is, is interesting character, because on one hand, we know that Bilam's prophecy was on the level of Moses. On the other hand, his morality was really bad. Um, which is, I just had a thought about that this week. This is not related to anything in the class. But it's a good lesson that, like, there can be a disconnect. There can be a difference between someone's spiritual powers and abilities. And if they're a mesh. Just because someone can do something neat doesn't mean they're a mesh. It's just an interesting idea. The Torah is highlighting to us. There can be certain people who are blessed with certain gifts and talents. And the truth of the matter is we take those talents and gifts and we use them because a lot of his prophecies become our own prayers. What we're going to read about in the Parsha today, when Bilam tries to curse the Jews, he ends up blessing the Jews. That becomes part of our prayers. So we like that. But the person himself is a rotten fellow. So it just shows there can be a real disconnect. And you know, just because someone is, is has some gifts or talents or what, what doesn't mean the inside is good. And it doesn't mean, by the way, that you can't utilize the good of the person. But you've got to differentiate between the person. But that's all parenthetical. Okay. The story starts off very interesting. Ga, uh, Bilam has the messengers come and they say, uh, Moab asks, he asks God. He has the ability to ask God questions. They ask me to go curse the Jewish people. Good idea or not a good idea? God says, not a good idea. And I remember last year, the year before, we had a class on that. Because Bilam keeps on asking God again and again. And by the third time, God says, go with him. And the famous question is, did God change his mind all of a sudden for another time? And we had that another year. In any event, he ends up going with them. But as he begins to go... He hits a roadblock, a very bizarre roadblock, perhaps one of the most perplexing and incredible stories in the entire Bible, entire Chumash. Our text one, page 252. Hal, it's all yours. In the morning, Balim arose, saddled his she-donkey, and went into the Moabite dignitary. Mo- went with the Moabite dignitaries. <coughs> God's wrath fled because he was going. And an angel of God stationed himself on the road to thwart him, and he was riding on his she donkey, and his two servants were with him. <coughs> the she donkey saw the angel of God stationed on the road with the sword drawn in his hand. So, so the she donkey turned aside from the road and went into a field. Bali beat the she donkey to get it back onto the road. The angel of God stood in the path of the vineyards with a fence on the side and a fence on that side. The she donkey saw the angel of God and she was pressed against the wall. She pressed Balaam's leg against the wall and he beat her again. The angel of God continued going ahead and he stood in a narrow place where there was no room to turn right or left. The she donkey saw the angel of God and it crashed down on the Balaam. Balaam angered fled and he beat the she donkey with a stick. God opened the mouth of the she-donkey, and she said to Bali, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? All right, well, let's save the last three verses for a moment. But even beforehand, the story is that the, the animal that he is riding on, the she-donkey, it's a nice way of saying it. <laughs> a lot of other Bibles have another translation for that, right? Um, senses there's an angel in the way that is blocking Balaam does not notice the difference, does not notice the angel. And each time he strikes the donkey, finally the third time this incredible miracle happens. 
and the donkey is able to talk. God opens the mouth of the donkey, and she says, what did I do that you struck me these three times? Okay, that is the story. Now here's my question. Why would it be that an animal saw something that a person could not see? Especially a person with the spiritual gifts. Well, I, Bill. Think, I think he could see it. He just didn't want to see it. So he overlooked it. In other words, there's things that are right before you. And if you have a preconceived notion, you sort of ignore or dismiss those things. Very good. So he, he sort of had blinders. He yeah. was on a mission. Right. He didn't want to, to see anything that would stop him. I like that. Very good. Very good. And uh, maybe the same thing happens to us sometimes. We don't pick up the signs and we're dead, you know. We want to get something done, even all the clues that tell us it's not a good idea. All right. Very good. I like that. Never thought of that before. What else? Donkey sees something. Forget about the donkey speaking for a moment. That's its own subject. Donkey sees something. So Nachmanides writes, when we say see, it doesn't mean see like I see you, Hal, or I see this computer over here. Seeing here should be translated as sensing. Sensing. Nachmanides writes text 2a, Marty. The she donkey saw the angel of God. The beings are spiritual beings who cannot be perceived with physical eyes, for they do not have a body that can be perceived. When they do appear to prophets or to those imbued with divine spirit, such as Daniel, they are perceived with intellectual vision, and the individual reaches the state of prophecy. But it is impossible for the eyes of an animal to see these things. Thus we can interpret the words that she donkey saw to mean that she sensed a frightening force blocking her passage, which was the angel which had set out to thwart the There's more. Oh. <laughs> when the Torah further states the she donkey saw the angel of God with his sword drawn in his hand does not mean that the donkey saw an angel or a sword, rather scripture alludes to the fact that the angel instilled such a dread in the donkey that it appeared to her as if he was about to be slaughtered. So like think of what would be in your own life, you're walking down the road minding your own business and all of a sudden the sixth sense hits you this ain't a good idea don't go here, maybe we've had experiences like that before that is what Nachmanides says is happening to the donkey over here, not literally seeing. We're discussing a spiritual reality. This is a sixth sense that the donkey had. You have a famous Kabbalist named the Rakanti who writes in text to, to be. We cannot deny these awesome words which are readily apparent to the beholder, meaning it's a sense. And he quotes the Talmud that says when dogs howl, sometimes they sense the angel of death is coming to town. In other words, they're not seeing something, they're sensing something. And an animals have the ability to have this sixth sense, but not something they can actually see. Yeah. I was thinking the animals don't have an ego like we do. Animals aren't I beings. Right. So if, you, if we can put aside our ego with we're afraid of our animal soul, which is the ego, but if we can put it aside, we become spiritual beings. They don't have it to put aside, so can it, you know, it limits their spiritual side, but it, in a way it makes them easier to know different things. Interesting. <clears throat> Although we do say that the animals don't have the spiritual soul, we only have the, the, the animal so I guess what Hal is saying that the spiritual soul indeed is less sophisticated than our soul, but the things that would block it might be less also. Right, right, right. Okay, so it works both ways. The intellectual capabilities are not there. The spark of God is not there, which we usually equate with intellectual abilities. And what else, by the way? What else do we normally equate, uh, associate spark of God, image of God with? When we say we are created in the image of God. Intelligence, but what else? Creation, the ability to create. Create animals, have kids. The ability to pray. Oh, the ability to send something higher than you. Okay. To create things. To existence. What else? Anyone else is uh, what else? Freedom of choice. Freedom of choice is <laughs> is a human part of the gift to human, because who is free to do what he wants? God. 
Similarly, God imbues in us freedom of choice. Okay? Now, freedom of choice means we have the ability to decide right and wrong. Because we have that ability, certain realities must be hidden from us or else we wouldn't have freedom of choice. So perhaps one could say that if an animal does not have freedom of choice, it wouldn't be that far-fetched to say that animals might be able to sense that which we can't sense because it would not get in the way of the freedom of choice. They don't have freedom of choice. But <clears throat> everyone got so the notion that an animal might be able to sense something that humans cannot sense. From a Kabbalistic perspective, that's not that out there. It is possible. Um, and we know that when it comes to smelling and seeing, they have a stronger sense. Uh, someone was saying by the tsunami. Right, right. How many dogs died? Yeah. yeah. How many dogs died? It's not. None, very few. And, so, and it, look, that, that might be something purely physical, right? Just... How would you? What would you attribute that at that to? Uh, better senses and being more in touch with, uh, with nature. fear. Well, you know, and they, and they fear know. of nature of of nature. Yeah, I mean, I mean, animals are a little more in touch with that, and they'll maybe <coughs> run away. Right, right. You know, so, you know, they're afraid of a storm coming. Okay, here, you know, you, tsunami coming. If they can kind of sense it, they they I don't know what it is, but they know it's a it's something to be afraid of. They're more in touch with nature. Did did we did we know that a tsunami was coming coming when it was. When the, was there winds? I'm just curious. Yeah, I use that as an example. Notice because they're able to tell there wasn't enough to get the people. There was this one there. girl. They say this teenage girl, whatever, uh, high schooler, that she saw the waves going back, and she mm, warned that, everybody. That she studied mm -hmm. like she just I learned see. in school, and she told everybody to get out of the beach, whatever. Right. But Brian, you're saying they have this more innate connection with nature and senses in a far superior way than, than we do. So it, it could be attributed purely to something physical. What I'm saying here is, and what we're going to say, that Chumash brings down from some of the other mystics, um, 4b, let's do 4b for a moment, and uh, Virgil, do you want to read her or not? No, I guess so. Okay, so we'll pass on roof. 4b on page 256. If God were to grant humans the perception to see angels, they would perform they would perforce see both benevolent and destructive angels, i.e. demons. Since the sight of destructive angels would be too overwhelming for most people, God generally does not grant humans this perception. But since animals do not have free choice and possess less sophisticated consciousness than humans, <coughs> they are not frightened by the sight of destructive angels. So God allows them to see angels. Okay, this is sort of parenthetical. It's not the point of today's class, but it's not out, It's not unheard of from a Kabbalistic perspective that an animal should see something that a person cannot because of the lack of ego, because of the lack of freedom of choice, because of better perception, so on and so forth. So that is what happens in this story. That is the more... They can see both good and bad angels. They can see angels in general. Supposedly. The, this source says that they have the, and again, when we say angels, we're, it's not, we're not talking about fluffy things over here. We're talking about negative energies, positive energies, destructive forces, positive forces. They might be, have a better sense of that because, again, it doesn't affect their actions. Yeah, I'm They're not going to act. Because, if we were to see it, we wouldn't have freedom of choice, right? Yeah. But their ability to see it does not impact their freedom of choice. Therefore... Perhaps, according to this, yeah, well, we'll see. Yeah. Well, I'd like to back up to a little bit more surface level. Mm -hmm. In this case, um, this angel was on a specific mission from God. Okay, so the general rules don't really apply here. And it is, this is a bizarre story. It, isn't it? I, 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 it is whatever God wants it to do. At one point, God decides that the she donkey is going to speak, so, so it speaks. So um, God's putting up a roadblock to try and get Bilam to turn back, but doesn't want to be so obvious with. An angel that you know, Bilam's gonna really get the idea. He's trying to influence Bilam's freedom of choice. The donkey is part of the scheme. Right. So it's so very it's hard to learn a, a, a regular rule from this story, which is on a specific mission. There, there, well yeah, said. Yeah. Well said. But the donkey did react to the angel. The donkey did show fear. In other words, mm. oh, 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 I better move. And so the the angel 
it seems to pat I'm the angel. The donkey, I think animals have some level of free choice. They do one thing versus another. They can act they good can or bad. Choice, right. But it's right. more based upon instinct and their natural. Well, you can get, ask them to go outside to use the bathroom but, and it's up to their free training, choice. Right. <laughs> the angel had uh, the angel. The donkey had some level of fear. That's why it moved right. and showed Right. Right, but it's not a moral good or bad. It's a uh, instinctive one, just like by the tsunami would be that way. But what, what you said, Brian, is very much similar to Rabbeinu Bahaya, not exactly, but he says the same thing. This is a unique story. There's a mission here. The mission is A, to give him some signs it's not a good idea that you go. And B, there's another idea here, and that was to humiliate the law. That after the three times, the donkey saw that which he did not see. It says God finally opened up his eyes. And then he sees it. And then he was humiliated. Here he was supposed to be this amazing prophet on the likes of Moses, who's about to go curse an entire people, and he's being paid the big bucks to do so. And here his donkey is able to see that which he can't see. And when his eyes were open because the donkey spoke? Too unrelated. It says oh, afterwards oh, God opened his eyes. Okay. God opened his eyes. So, on the level of Peshat, Peshat would mean the most simple explanation. 257, uh, Pam. On the level of, of Peshat, the talking donkey is a great miracle that completely defies nature. God performed this great miracle for the honor of the Jewish people, to impart, impart the message that even an animal recognized that this was a mission not worth undertaking. Even an animal that has limited intellectual intellect appreciated that it was that it is inappropriate to co cooperate in cursing a blessed nation. So he was supposed to get the message over here that it's not a good idea. Even the animal understands it's not a good idea. Why do you, evil one, insist on continuing on your mission? Okay, that's part one. Sort of interesting fun facts. But now we'll go to the main part of the class. Any questions? Nope. Okay, we will go further. The donkey wants so, to say something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. That was good. I should note that there are a few commentators that don't that actually say that this story, interesting, was part of the prophecy of the law. They do say that this entire episode happened within a dream, within a prophecy of the law. Not that the physical donkey spoke. So that is suggested by some commentators. There are others who are not only do not agree, but vehemently disagree. They say, once you say this, it's a very dangerous line to cross. Because are you going to say the splitting of the sea was a, was a prophecy? Are you going to say other biblical stories didn't actually happen in real life? So there, but I just want to put it out there that that is suggested by one or two. He's on a mission. This has to do with prophecy. He's seeing things. By tradition in the donkey, one of the, the ten things God created. Correct. Ethics of our father says that at the creation of the world, that special donkey was already put in place to do this specific mission, but and never another donkey was going to do that. Yes? I don't know why I say that, because it doesn't, it doesn't change the message. The message is still the same. Whether he dreamt it or he saw it, or it happened. That's Correct. Just, so why so because there? it's still, again, if one were to go down that line, it's a dangerous, slippery slope that one could... So, so I guess that I guess yeah. that commentator didn't care for the degree of outside of nature by having the donkey Correct. speak. And so it was looking for another explanation. Correct. And but, especially because it didn't serve a particular purpose in this case. It wasn't like the splitting of the sea, which had to accomplish the salvation of the Jewish people and could not have been done through a prophecy. It wasn't like manna or the well of Miriam or earthquake of Korach, which had to accomplish a specific physical action. This was about a message. And the message could have happened via a prophecy. So might that might be one. That being said, the message is that much more powerful if it were to happen in real life. Okay. But what we're going to focus on now is the answer of the donkey to Bilam, and the rest of the class is going to be the spiritual meaning of that. The donkey said, why are you striking me three times? Can't you see I had an obstacle in front of me? And of course, Bilam is forced to say no until God opens his eyes. But the word in Hebrew is, and we'll go back to the 
text one on 252, he writes, Ma sisilacha, what did you do to me? Kihikitani zeh, for you have hit me, shalosh rigalim. Shalosh means three. Rigalim, regal, <laughs> interesting, okay. Shalosh rigalim is not the normal way in the Torah to say three times. Shalosh pa'amim is normally pa'am is time. Shalosh pa'amim means three times. Shalosh regalim does mean three times a year in a very specific context. Does anyone know where in the Torah shalosh regalim means three times a year? For the three festivals. It says shalosh regalim three times a year. The Jews were all supposed to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And even until today, there are three holidays throughout the year that are called the Shalosh Regalim. Which holidays are the Shalosh Regalim? Sukkot. Sukkot was one. Shavuot. Shavuot and Passover. Those three are called the Shalosh Regalim. It means times, three times a year you would go to you would go to Jerusalem. But you said Regal also means it's what? Leg. Like if you go by Regal, you walk. Yeah. You know, they didn't take cars in those days to Israel. How did they go to Israel? They walk. Maybe they had some donkeys or horses. But they had to go via feet. So the Torah actually referred to as the three times a year where you would walk. So in that context, I understand why it calls it Shalosh Regalim. But in this verse, in the story of Bila, where the donkey says, Why did you hit me Shalosh Regalim? That's a, that's a very odd way of putting it. And it's not three times while I was walking. Correct. Correct. What, so, is so while regal could mean time, that's not the regular use of time. Shalosh pa'amim would be far more appropriate. And it is here where the oral tradition makes a correlation, makes an association with the other time in Torah we have this expression, shalosh regalim, and says, not this is not literal, but this would be the deeper explanation. These three times, Regalim, yeah. she hinted to him, you seek to uproot a nation which celebrates three primary festivals, Shalosh Regalim, in a year? Right. So you're on a bad mission. You're trying to curse the Jewish people. Don't you know who these Jewish people are? They are people that are going to do Shalosh Regalim. Three times a year, they're going to celebrate festivals in Jerusalem. Okay. Is that all you have on the Jewish people? I mean... This is the people that say the Shema every single day. These are the people that, you know, heard the God at Sinai. There are a lot of ways the donkey could have complimented the Jewish people, complimented their faith, and said why this is an endeavor not worthwhile for you to pursue. Why does the oral tradition, and that is going to be the rest of this class, why the emphasis on you're trying to uproot a nation which celebrates Shalosh Regalim? What is it? about the Shalosh Regalim that is so extraordinary that this is, this is what is highlighted by the law. Two below, not by the law. So there's going to be two answers. And the first, because of time, we're actually going to skip. We're going to go to the second answer on page 61. But first, just from people around the room or the online community, what would be significant in the fact that there are three times a year that we make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem? They're supposed to do it. But why would this be highlighted? What is it? Because they went to the temple and gave offerings? So they that was part of it. They had to go to the temple. They had to bring offerings. It says three times a year you should go to the temple. And the verse continues, you shouldn't show up empty-handed, actually. <laughs> Don't come. By the way, it, was, it stimulated the economy in Jerusalem tremendously. You can imagine. Yeah. It did that as well. All the hotels were booked. It was tough to find, you know, vacation <laughs> rental. And a donkey happy. will not be sacrificed. The donkey, the donkey didn't have happy. to win then. The donkey was happy about that. All right, that's good. That's why the donkey mentioned it. I'm not involved in this one. So the donkey might have to schlep. That's a real schlep for the donkey, right? To schlep all the way from all over the place to Jerusalem. It's also a very important sense of community just for everyone to gather. Yeah. Yeah. You need that gathering. Because someone can there. So it was that sense of 
everyone coming together. Pretty amazing if you think about everyone being there. Yeah. Um, I mean, and this happened, by the way. This is not like even historians discuss it. Josephus discusses what Passover was like when everyone descended on Jerusalem. And talk about the offerings. He discusses the amount of lambs that everyone is bringing and how the baths of Jerusalem, you can just imagine the whole Jerusalem filled with the lands. So this happened. This is history. He mentions the Shalosh Regalim. So we're going to get back to that in a moment. But in order to do so, we're going to mention a very fascinating Talmud, Talmudic story. This is from the Talmud in Sanhedrin 102. It's a story that's quoted often for various reasons. The explanation that we give here today is something different than I've ever heard before. This is the story. This happened in Talmudic times, so the years are probably uh, 400, 500, 600 of the Common Era from the sages of the Talmud. Which Talmud? Babylonia. So these are in Iraq, Iran. This is when Judaism was, was flourishing, at least the study of, of rabbinic law was flourishing. All right, it's a long text. Here it goes. In the college of Rabbi Ashi, the lecture one day terminated at Three Kings. Tomorrow, he said, we will commence with our colleagues. A uh, class ended at the college. College means the study hall. They had finished. They were about to start the Three Kings. Three Kings is a section in the Mishnah that discusses three pretty rotten kings in Jewish history. One's name was Achav. One's name was Menashe. One's name was Yeruvam. These were three not-so-good kings in Jewish history. Unfortunately, Jewish history is full of some good kings and lots of not-so-good kings. In any event, all right, we're going to finish with the three kings. Tomorrow we'll commence with our colleagues. Colleagues, they refer to as the kings. Like, tomorrow we'll discuss our buddies, those kings. That night, Menasha came and appeared to him in a dream. You have called us your colleagues and the colleagues of your father. Let us see if you truly are a comparable scholar. From what part of the bread is the peace for reciting, the Hamatsi blessing to be taken? I do not know, he answered. You have not learned this, he jibed, yet you call us your colleagues? Teach it to me, Rabbi Ashi begged, and tomorrow I will teach it in your name at the session. He answered, from the part that is baked into a crust. He then questioned him. If you are so wise, why did you worship idols? He replied, were you there, you would have lifted up the hem of your garment and sped after me to join me. Okay, let's go through this section of the Talmud. Menashe was an evil king. He worshipped idols, and he encouraged the Jews to worship idols as well. This Menashe figure comes to Rabbi Ashi, who lived, I don't know, a thousand years later. I don't know exactly. It could be in a dream. You're calling me your colleague. Let me see how much Torah do you know? And he asks him some question. When you make hamotzi, do you say from the inner part of the bread or the outer part of the bread? The answer was the outer part of the bread. He didn't know the answer. See, I know Torah that you don't even know. Don't call me your colleague. So he says, wait a minute. You're such a tall. I didn't know you're a Torah scholar. What I read about you in Hebrew school, or what I read about you in Tanakh, was some evil king that worshipped idols that was a good for nothing, that had absolutely no Torah. He says, that, no, 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 that's not true. And he says, not only that, if you lived back when I was there, you would be running after me in order to worship idols. So there's a few parts of this story. One part of the story is important, I think, for us. Whenever we read biblical stories, at least I always wonder, why the heck are they always worshiping idols? Like, what is so, you know, uh, uh, tempt, you know tempting about, about some stones and brick? I mean, like, come on, can you? And like, great people. So whether it's the golden calf story or whether it's later in history in Tanakh, the Jews are always, for heaven's sake, what's with it already? Immediate gratification. Uh, what kind of gratification did you well, get, though? I thought, mean, what did you, what did... They thought by worshiping those things, they would get their wishes, they would get whatever they needed right then, right so now. If the and God we are the same way. We are still worshiping God today. We are the same way. Crew of different sorts. Idols. I mean. Correct. Instant gratification. But why the the... the, the so it is true that we still worship all sorts of well, idols today, well, all forms true. of materialism and instant gratification and all sorts of money and whatnot. Um, but at least that form of it. Like, look, money, I can understand the temptation, but idols? So what's the answer to that? So one 
part of this Talmud is, God plants a different Yetzer Hara, a different evil inclination in different generations. You cannot judge another generation because the evil inclination was different and the times were different. We have the test that we have to deal with today and that's our Yetzer Hara. They had the test that they had to deal with. And he says, don't start just like judge. You don't know what it would have been like. It was apparently something very, very tempting. And fortunately, we're not tempted to run after these stone gods today. We're tempted after other things that might have not been as tempting to those people back then. Any thoughts on that before I get? That's true. And we got different different temptations. Today. Which are, yeah. Any thoughts on that, huh? However, that, that's the way I normally read this story. Um, but there's another way to read the story as well. And that is that Ravashi is surprised at the fact that this Menashe is a scholar. Like, like, whoa, I didn't think of you that way. You studied Torah. Like, how could you have studied Torah and still done this? And he basically answers, yeah, I studied Torah. Yeah, we tried, but guess what? It was an evil inclination that was too strong for us to overpower. We all got the Yitzhahara, and that was our Yitzhahara, and I felt great to it. But that's different than just being someone that's ignorant and just have nothing better to do than worship idols. Meaning there are two ways that a person could sin, right? One is they're not involved in anything productive and they've made a, a, a way of life out of bad things. Okay, that's A. And B is they're trying to get involved in good things. Their heart, what do they really want to do? What do they really want to do? Good. good. But... But they're evil in connection. Yeah, and, and it's a big difference for everyone in the world. I mean, even people that do sins could probably be divided in one of these two categories. And I'm sure there's lots of along the ways, you know, levels amongst them. But like, is it that this is the way of life for you? If I ask you, do you really want to be doing this? What is the answer? Yes or no? Yes. Hopefully. Hopefully the answer is no, and I wish I had the means to overcome it. There could also be the opposite. Yes, I do, and don't get in my way. Right. I hear that a lot. I don't want anything to get in my way. Imagine for a moment someone, God forbid, you know, you know even addicted to drugs, let's say. Use that as an example. And, and mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're, so it could be one of two ways. One is someone that's heavily addicted, and he's on his way. He's walking. He hopes right now he bumps into the dealer to be able to get what he wants. And the other person is hoping he's going to bump into his friend and he's not going to see the dealer because he doesn't want to, but he falls prey to it. And all the levels in between. So Ravashi always thought we're going to learn the way the Maharal of Prague learns this story, that Menashe was of the lower category, some of the good for nothing that was just entrenched in idols and had nothing good to him. And he answers that at all. That wasn't who I was. I studied Torah. I couldn't. He says, not only that, but if you were there, you would have been running perhaps in a way even worse than me. Text 10, the way the Maharal learns this story. By the way, another nice part of the story is whenever we read stories, unfortunately it happens of people we always thought of as good people that were involved in something not so good. Ever happen? Mm -hmm. Ever hear such a thing? So what normally happens is everyone's quick, oh, they must be hypocrite, none of the good that they did was for real. Is that true? Yeah, but you know, no, sorry. no it, they might have done a lot of good. Unfortunately, they had a problem and never got help. It doesn't dismiss all the good that they did. I'm not trying in any way to dismiss the bad that they did either, by the way. That's not my goal over here. My goal is that they have good and bad, and they never dealt with their Yitzhahara, and a person can have a lot of good and a lot of bad inside of them. So let's see the way the Maharal of Prague learns this story of Bilam. All right, Tom. Rabbi Ashi figured that the three kings chased after idols simply because they were fools, as opposed to doing so because of feeling overwhelmed by the evil inclination. Manashi replied that this was not the case. They were actually great scholars, and it was their evil inclination, inclinations which overwhelmed them and drove them to idolatry. Menashe continued, were you there, you would have lifted up the hem of your garments and sped after me. When a scholar sins and acknowledges his sin, 
and recognizes that he is at the mercy of his urges. He hopes that some external force will prevent him from sinning. Please, I hope my mom walks in right now, right? <laughs> or my friend, they're hoping for that ability for something to stop them. Okay. But when a thoughtless person sins, the opposite is true. If something stands in the way of his urges, he removes the obstacle and continues, for he doesn't recognize the gravity of his sins. This, then, is what Menasha meant. If you were there, you wouldn't have acted as an intelligent person who hopes for the obstacle. Rather, you would you bleh, rather you would have removed the obstacle. For example, the cloak that would hinder your pursuit of adultery. You would hold it between your teeth so it shouldn't stop you from running. For you are not as wise as the people of my generation. Menasha and his her cert, ilk certainly wished for obstacles to come their way. For they knew the gravity of their sins. So they're not certainly giving them the benefit of the doubt over here. Again, not dismissing the sins that they did, but just saying that it came, they fell prey to the Yitzhahara. So we have two types of sinners, right? That's what we have over here, two types of sinners. Let us now do the mirror of each. If there are two types of sinners, and one what you know really wants to do what's wrong and hopes nothing is going to get in the way, Another one wants to do what's exactly right. and hopes that they're caught at the end. Yeah. That thing that finally prevents them to do they don't want to do it. But they feel they're but hoping they're that external wild. they're hoping the external force, they're caught, they're this or that. And then so if there's two types of sinners, the one that really wants to do it and the one that deep down doesn't want, and is hoping something's gonna come their way that will pull them apart, what's the mirror of each? Two ways to do mitzvahs. Right? Two ways to do good. There's two ways of doing good as well. There is doing good in a way where you're doing it, I need to do it. But I'm hoping that an external force will come along, an excuse will come along, <laughs> a, oh man, my flight was delayed, what can I do? Oh well, I, the power was, I'm hoping for an opportunity and we all know what those might be, you know. And I'm a little bit tired, so I can't make it today. You know, anything that will not allow you to do that mitzvah. And then there's another type of doing good where you're running with your cloak to do good. Now, nothing can stand in the way for you to do that mitzvah. What is the difference between the two, of course? Um, not, you know, what's the litmus test of where you are if you're doing a mitzvah with joy? If you're doing a mitzvah with joy, this is why in Chassidus there's such an emphasis on Ivdu at Adonai Besimcha, serve God with joy. Serving God with the joy, it's not just that the quality of the mitzvah is better. That's, that, that is true. The quality of anything is done better when it's with joy. But more than that, it shows, is this being done out of duty, necessity, or is this being done out of passion because this is where I really want to. And it's a good time. I mean, it, in our lives, there's some... But I'm not... It's also good to do things out of necessity. But it's even better to do things out of joy. And it's even better to have that thing where I'm not looking for excuses. In, and, yeah. But I would think some mitzvahs, um, visiting the family of a deceased, mm. maybe going to the hospital to mm. hold the hand of a... If a dying person, I'm not sure joy is the right way to be doing those events. But, well, but would, the, would the joy aspect of that be you're happy to do your part? You're, you're, you know it needs to be done and you're doing it and you're not looking to shirk. And you know that you are fulfilling a mitzvah because you're fulfilling a need, one of God's needs. God uses us in many different ways. So how I think what we're talking about here is an outward display of simcha versus an inward display of simcha. Right? Simcha joy. Certainly when you are doing those duties, you're not going with a smile. Right, but those are not joyful duties. They're not joyful experiences. You want to be able to do other types of mitzvahs. This is not where you want to be. But if divine providence put you there, then at, once you're at that place, you're doing it with this inner, I don't want to use the word even satisfaction, this inner feeling of, this is my mission. This is where I need to be. So you're right. The word joy is not used across the board. But even then, 
Yeah, but I think it's particularly in the more uncomfortable mitzvahs where this is applicable. Because it's particularly in the more uncomfortable mitzvahs where it's more likely that we would want the excuse to come our way that might allow us to prevent us from having to do it. There's a difference of wanting the excuse and ignoring the excuse okay. when it comes. Correct. So this is what he writes over here, and we're out of time, so I'll just paraphrase this. There are two ways to serve God. Look on page 264. Well, Brunstein writes, you can do it because you're commanded, and if there's any opportunity to get out, you do it because it's a burden. But some do it because they really wish to. And a sure way to determine the difference is to see whether the person does it with joy. Now, if there's any holiday, excuse me, any mitzvah that associated with joy, it was our holidays. The Shalosh Regalim in the Torah, it says that they have to be done with joy. It says, Simcha, 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 Vahayita Ach Sameach. You have to be happy. In order to fulfill the ha ha holidays, they have to be done with joy. Now, it's one thing today to do it with joy when we do it from the comforts of our home. Let's imagine what it was like in the old days, having to schlep all the way to Jerusalem. Let's also imagine the fear. Look, I would be afraid in the days before the alarm systems on our homes. Everyone knowing the entire town would be left empty? That's kind of scary. You could be going with a little bit of apprehension, right? A little bit of, oh, you got to do this, whatever. Right, what will I come back to? And, and, and right, what will I come back to? And Bilaam was pointing to the fact that when the Yid didn't go up, they do it's a holiday of joy. They schlep with joy. They leave their homes with joy. I doubt it was Hilton and the Hyatt when they got to Jerusalem. The inconvenience is done with tremendous amount of simcha and joy because this is where they want to be. And that's a true indication of who they are. Very different from you, Bilaam, where there is such a dichotomy, such a difference between your spiritual you and the immoral, the immoral you. Where there's something you know you should be doing, and then there's stuff that is always taking you away from what you should be doing. He's saying, if you're trying to curse these people, you will not be successful, because these are the people with the shalosh regalim. Three times a year they go up. But the take-home for us, again, is the importance of permeating every mitzvah we do, trying to do so. It takes avodah, it takes work to do it in a way of joy. And a good litmus test will be that even when a little obstacle comes along the way, We'll run with our skirts or whatever the expression was over there. We're a man on a mission, a woman on a mission to get that mitzvah. Well, what does it mean yeah. when you said about the cloak? We can do it with the cloak. Well, that he, he, the example, he see that he, Menashe told him in a dream. If you lived in my times, you would like spread, what was the, you would. Lift the hem. You know, lift up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Exactly. Uh, you don't want to like you just want to get there and nothing to stop you along the way. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, that so was men wore robes then too, so would right, have the right. problem of running in them. Yeah, 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 that's that's a right. wheel trip on the hem. Yeah, trip exactly. All, the time. all <laughs> right. Any questions from the online audience? Nope. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, everyone, for joining us this week. And the take home of the week is that we should do good deeds, and we should make sure that the good deeds that we do are imbued with a joy. We should look for excuses or things that get in the way. We should get the job done and do it with Simcha, do it with joy. Thank you so much for joining us today. tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. Our weekly lineup of call-in programs includes Computers 2K Now with Amnon Nissan, Health In with Debbie Brooke, Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon, Lessons of Vietnam with NCBBI members, The Tanya Love Show, Your Healthy Pet with Gisela DiCarlo. And if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it at www.nissancommunications.com. Sponsored by Atomus.com, makers of quality video recorders and converters for professionals. CarolinaApparel.com and DeltaForce.net.